Hi, this is your host, Sublim Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of TFR. Let's talk, and today we have with us once again, after a long time, Sheng Liang, and now uh, CEO and co-founder of Acorn Labs. Sheng, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, thank you, Shwapna. It's great to be on the show again. Yeah, I'm so happy to see you again, and I want to talk about this new company. So, so tell me, uh, first of all, when I look at you, you're like, you know, you're back to your roots, which is, you know, creating companies, solving new problems because of a rancher laps and Sousa. So I want to understand, you know, your journey in these years, uh, which led to the creation of Acorn Labs. I'm quite privileged to be able to build a career under, uh, along the line of some of the biggest shifts in a uh, in, 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 in IT, in, 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 especially in cloud computing. So back in uh, 2008, uh, I created my first company called cloud.com. And that was uh, developing open source software for infrastructure as a service. We created a piece of software for called CloudStack and, and that was quite successful. And then 2014, uh, uh, we were able to, uh, jump on the Docker bandwagon and created Rancher Labs, which uh, later became a, uh, a leader in Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes clusters, Kubernetes distros, Kubernetes uh, management. So, so that, that again was a great journey. And, and with Acorn Labs, what we're looking to do is we're looking finally to go from the infrastructure layer to the application layer, application management layer, because both with you know cloud stack and uh, uh, rancher we were managing virtual machine infrastructure and uh, container infrastructure but most we look at most uh, uh, DevOps engineers or developers these days they care more about the applications and there's still a lot to be done to simplify and expedite that experience and that's what Acorn Labs is for and and most importantly I'm able to do it with the same group of people. My friends, you know, uh, Shannon, Will, and Darren, folks I've been working with for all the last uh, three companies. So I'm really excited about that. So you're kind of creating other, you know, there's a PayPal mafia, right? Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. And so <laughs> we have uh, your own little group, you know, of, you know, folks who are, you know, creating new companies, solving new problems in different era. Uh, I want to just uh, go back to it because you're saying, you know, you, with this company, Acorn Labs, you're looking at solving, you know, problems for application developers. Uh, that's an interesting thing because when we look at the, and I may be totally wrong, the whole uh, AWS cloud native, we start talking about DevOps, where you know developers things are moving, sh shifting left, uh, developers, operators, the lines were burning. But the fact is that actually I do not know how good that was or good that is as much as we like to talk about because there will always be folks who are more interested in security there will always be folks who are more interested in networking there will always be folks who understand operations better than and then the the, the 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 most important thing is that businesses need applications that give them an edge when the job to to write the application to manage it operate it secure it it just becomes too much. So how do you see this whole evolution of developers' lives? So, and wh where do you see it's heading? Then we can talk about Acorn. I mean, I think you're spot on. There's definitely been a shift left movement um, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, developers create the, the applications themselves that need to be run. But what's happening is um, uh, the effort it took to, uh, to you know, package the applications to, uh, to stage the applications, to actually deploy the applications, to upgrade the applications, to monitor the applications, that became a discipline of its own. So, so that you know that used to be called ops. Then it was called DevOps because a lot of these guys, the way they were doing things, there's so much automation that these guys look like developers themselves. So, um, and 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 the DevOps discipline, uh, in some ways, in the last ten years, probably grew even faster than than, than developers. I mean, as as you know, applications get more uh, sophisticated, and as platforms like Kubernetes became more popular, the uh, the effort it takes to run these uh, applications reliably and securely increased as well. And, and, and that's where we see an opportunity. Uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 that's exactly what motivated us to, um, uh, to create Acorn Labs. 
uh, we, we we believe Acorn and you know its associated products will be a great set of tools to improve developer and DevOps productivity to actually bring uh, uh, developer, DevOps, and ops teams even closer together. And at the end of the day, to increase agility and security and reliability of, of the whole application de uh, development lifecycle. Excellent. Excellent. Very well said. I also want to ask you, uh, if we just look at application developers, uh, a lot of things, you know, security, for example, is not an afterthought. It has to be baked in from the early on. We are seeing a lot of movement happening in CI and CD as well. So if I ask you, how is the life of application developers still changing? Because a lot of things should become, uh, they should be considered early stage of writing an application, which will also, yes. what are some of the pain points that are there that you see? And that's what you want to address for application developers with Acorn Labs. Yeah, so ideally uh, what developers want to do is they want to you know, build the application and then they just want this same application to just run in production. By the way, that used to be the case, you know, back in the in back twenty years ago. Uh, uh, pretty much back then, the infrastructure was a lot simpler. F things already running on the internet, but all it took back then were, uh, you know, with some servers and maybe some load balancers, some storage arrays, some network switches. Those things uh, don't take. A lot of effort to program. So, so typically you just get the packages, you know, you get the Java, Java files or something, and then just copy it onto those machines. And, and, and more importantly, those machines don't get updated very often. So, so once you deploy an app, you probably update it once every, you know, three months, six months, a year. And, and, and that model worked. But, what, but, but these days you have uh, situations where Either developers use like a uh, like a highly uh, automated or opinionated pass solution platform as a service, so they will be able to write something, and and in some ways then uh, very quickly that gets pulled into production. Or you, you you look at the Kubernetes space, developers will you know write something, create containers, and then hand it over to the ops team to to then repack. A lot of times repackage it, write the YAML files write the deployment scripts, debug the Terraform scripts, and then, and then, you know, and then uh, run it in and operate it in production. So, so those have been kind of two models. And, uh, and I think the second model is basically way more successful, even though PaaS in many ways is a lot more developer friendly. And we're, we're uh, you know, for a variety of reasons that people know about, PaaS hasn't completely uh, taken the world by storm. And, and I mean, we, we definitely, so, so there's always this holy grail. How can we, um, uh, uh, how can we actually make things a little bit more efficiently than, than, than the current practice of developers building something and throw it over the wall <laughs> to, to, into productions and, and versus, you know, not then not having to, them to having to conform all the constraints and opinions of a, of a past. So, so, so Acorn is uh, very much an effort along this direction. Excellent. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, I want to talk about the company itself, and then I'll talk about the product and project because open source is always a you know very strong point with you. So first, I'll talk about the company itself. What's going to be uh, your model after the team is already there? Uh, what what is your plan? How you plan to grow investment? So talk about the company. Yeah, I mean we 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 formed the company uh, fairly recently, and uh, and and we're gonna follow. Uh, the, a model we're very comfortable with, which we really believe is the most effective and efficient way uh, to build uh, software companies, which is open source. Uh, so, so the great thing about open source is not, uh, it's not a religious belief. It is just a very pragmatic uh, business consideration. Uh, the, 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 you know, a lot of people say these days, it's a lot easier to write software than to get people to use your software. So open source is a great answer to that. You know, once we, like we developed this Acorn project, we announced it earlier, uh, just, 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 just a few days ago. And it's been, uh, uh, you know, the, the response has been quite remarkable. And, uh, and, and that allows us to understand you know whether we build has, has some value if, if, if there's no uh, uh, feedback, if there's, Really, no response from customers. Then, then we will just move on to something new. 
And, and the, the, also the great thing about open source is, you know, unlike say a, a, an online service, a SaaS service, nothing wrong with that, but those things require quite a bit of upfront investment to get, you know, to get operations going, to get a lot of certifications going before people can realistically use it, right? And and, and if somehow the, the service is not too successful, it's it's a bit hard to retire it because people are still will still be using it. Whereas the cost of failure in in, in, in open source software is fairly low. You know, if, if you say this this piece of software is not <laughs> is not really taking off, you could Kind of stop developing it, and then in, and people a, a small number of people who are still using it, I mean, can continue to use it. It's just not going to get any better uh, anymore, and they'll slowly migrate away. So, so, so the open source software model is a great model, and we intend to follow uh, uh, with, with Acorn Labs. And another beauty of open source is that you know, even if you there may be some other you know still they might take over the code base, they might maintain it. You know, they can maintain if if they do rely on, let's say, the proprietary software. They if they do rely on, they can take the code and maintain it. So for the transition, so that's a beauty. Um, Absolutely, of of course, if there are enough people who wanted enough to be able to maintain it, I'm sure we'll maintain it and exactly it as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I also want to understand. Uh, the product, what does what does Accords, you know, product look like? How people can use it? Early on, we were discussing this this gap between dev and ops, and uh, and that's 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 really what um, what Acorn is about, and uh, and it's motivated by a lot of our experience uh, with Kubernetes users. So as as you know, Rancher and and OpenShift uh, and VMware Tanzu, those are you know a few of the very popular. Uh, Kubernetes distros, and I, I think those distros primarily people use it on premise. Then in the cloud, people would use um, uh, services like EKS, GKE, AKS, right? The cloud providers run Kubernetes services. So basically, at this point, the the, the setting up Kubernetes clusters and and just run the Kubernetes clusters, that problem is very well solved. Uh, but then what we realize, what we notice is it still takes a lot of effort for organizations. A lot of times those Kubernetes platform teams, you know, they sometimes it's it's part of their cloud platform teams. They they still have to do a lot of extra work on, on top of it to make sure that these Kubernetes clusters are configured properly. These Kubernetes clusters are configured securely. They are, they are upgraded correctly. A lot of times upgrading of Kubernetes clusters separate from the application upgrade that runs on top of the Kubernetes cluster. So it's, it's really uh, undesirable because, because it seems like you know, Kubernetes is supposed to improve developer and DevOps agility and security. It, it does, but in some ways it introduced yet another layer of, ris uh, of responsibility to manage, right? And that, you know this very well, Schwabner. I mean, this this, this, like these days, pretty much every day, I, I, can, I can turn on my Twitter or LinkedIn. There's always a discussion going on about Kubernetes complexity, so-called. And, and it shouldn't be like this because, because early on, if you, if, you, you know, if, you, if you remember the, you know, if you got uh, some of you audience still remember the, 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 the you know, web logic days or something, you know, the sprint days or even, even Cloud Foundry days, they were less talk about that because back then the idea was, yeah, there's a middleware, there's an app server, but but those things are kind of subservient to the applications. And you don't, there's not, they're complicated, but they're, I mean, Oracle stuff is complicated, you know, web logic stuff is complicated, but you don't, you don't then spend a whole lot of, a whole big team automating and securing that layer itself, right? So, so we, we, we realized there was something wrong and, and, and then we and, and we also realize like going all the way to paths is probably not a good idea. We just don't have the insight to create a path like where everyone else has only had modest success. So 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 really the biggest insight that we had with Acorn is we realized uh, people are just trying to do use Kubernetes to be, do a little bit too much. In some sense, it is for it is good about Kubernetes, but it's also a little. Uh, it's, it's kind of an unfortunate side effect. It is just too powerful. You know, the <laughs> Kubernetes is, you, you don't, you can't, you don't just use Kubernetes to deploy apps. It could just deploy NFV. It could do, you know, it could, it, it, it could do SDN. It could do storage. It could do 
anything and everything on the world is possible with, with Kubernetes. So in some ways, whenever you're operating Kubernetes clusters, whenever you're upgrading Kubernetes clusters, you don't really know what's running on top of it. I mean, it could be a service mesh, right? It could be infrastructure, additional infrastructure itself. So obviously it's just a lot harder. Like when we were working on Rancher, it was always so hard try to add some value or like do something more to manage EKS clusters better. Because in some ways, you know, if there is something more, Amazon would have done it, of course, but, but also it's because it's fundamentally hard because you just, you know, EKS is so flexible. It's so powerful that, that just, you know, it, it, you just don't know what, what people is up there are doing. I mean, I remember technologies like OPA, open policy agents are very popular, but, so the idea is you 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 essentially put a put a put a guard you know in the, where the API requests coming in and then and then you look at you know if I allow this API request or not if what is this API trying to do who's trying to do it so it sounds good except then you look at what's coming in these 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 requests are so low level at such a high volume you don't really know what is it for right there's no structure you don't know what the purpose of this stuff is so you can't really make any decisions you know so so that's why we realized actually creating a because most people are going to interested like maybe five ten percent of the people have very very you know advanced use cases for kubernetes but most people most it organizations most devops organizations they use kubernetes for application deployment so, so we, if we could just you know, build a higher level abstraction for uh, application deployment, and then uh, uh, that would make, ultimately make managing Kubernetes and managing apps a lot easier. So, so that's what we set out to do. And that has the, like Acorn is, is basically a, a new portable you know, application artifact that, 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 that captures any kind of Kubernetes application. It has to be an application, it can't be, uh, system level stuff, pri privilege stuff that you cannot do. But as long as it's an application, it can capture it. And it's something that developers are very easy to work with. And then the uh, uh, ops people will be able to uh, deploy on any Kubernetes cluster. So that's the technical insight and justification uh, for our product. Hopefully it makes sense to me. Shank, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about your new company, Acorn Labs. And I look forward to our next conversation soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Schwabnil. Thanks for the opportunity to come talk to you about Acorn and our new company. And I really look forward to uh, us getting to the next milestone so we can tell you more.